Hello again and welcome back to another day, another week of daily Bible study. Uh, we're not going to finish the Gospel of Luke today or this week, but we will almost certainly next week, which means we spent almost a half of a year uh, on this particular book, but we'll move on to something next soon. Before that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, we thank you as we come into this uh, climactic moment in the story of Jesus. Lord, help us to never forget what you are calling us to. And Lord, our future and our lives are not called to be sunshine and rainbows. It is called to be obedient. Lord, help us to have attitudes and have commitments that will remain strong even in the midst of difficulties. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to continue on with the story of Jesus has been betrayed, he's been before Pilate and all the rest of those things, and now he is uh, being uh, taken away from, from Pilate. And so we're going to start in, uh, this is chapter 23, starting in verse 26. This is what we read. It says, When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country, and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him was a large crowd of the people, and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and to the breasts that never nursed. And then they will begin to say, To the mountains fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For to do these things, when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. So this is one of those passages. This, um, this bearing of the cross by Simon of Cyrene, I believe, only shows up uh, in, in one of the gospel. I believe it's only in the gospel of Matthew. I could be mistaken on that. Um, and it's interesting, so this idea that somebody else would carry Jesus' cross. And the, the, the basic kind of biological reason why someone like this might be necessary is because by the time Jesus has gotten to this point, he has been absolutely... Uh, beaten within an inch of his life. There are many people who are sentenced to crucifixion or who were sentenced to crucifixion who never actually die from crucifixion because um, they die before that from, from exsanguination, you know, the loss of their blood uh, or other such things. I mean, Jesus will have had his back torn up. He's got bleeding from all over the place. And so he literally is unable to carry this cross. And I don't know if you've ever carried a wooden cross before, maybe part of the ministry of the church or whatever. It's not necessarily really easy to carry. I mean, it's easier to carry than an equivalently sized piece of something else because you can actually, you can put it on your back. You can carry it, you know. Um, but it's not like it's a really lightweight, fun thing to do because it has to be sturdy enough to support a human being being hoisted up on it. And so the thing is, it's very possible that Jesus just literally does not have the physical strength to do this. So we, they, they bring somebody else in to carry it for him, which my understanding is was not entirely uncommon um, thing to have happen. Uh, it is interesting that we hear about Simon of Cyrene by name, which makes me wonder if he had become a significant disciple uh, in the days to come. You know, why do we remember Simon of Cyrene? And we don't, because we don't just say they grabbed a person to carry their cross. They name him as where he's, uh, who he is and where he's coming from. He's coming in for the thing for, the, for, for various reasons. And so it seems to me that probably there's something going on that Simon probably played a role in the early church. Exactly what? I don't know. Um, but what I really want to draw attention to for the purpose of Bible study and reflection and applying to life is this thing that happens that Jesus is being followed by, um, by a crowd of people and of women who are mourning and lamenting. And they seem to be lamenting, oh, it is so sad that Jesus is being killed. And, and, and you know, it might be that they are lamenting because there, there's always been people who have lamented anybody who's going for a death sentence. Um, so there's a possibility that there might not just be people who are responding because he's Jesus. They might just be responding because their heart breaks anytime anybody is being put to death. More likely is that at least some of these people are following because they know who Jesus is and they're lamenting that he is going to be put to death. And um, there's also a sense that perhaps they're following because all of these things that Jesus has symbolized are not going to come to fruition because he's going to die. But Jesus doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't say, woe is me. I mean, he's the one who's going to face death and he turns to these women. He stops and he says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves and weep for your children. And he says, because things are going to get worse before they get better. They're going to get harder before they're easier. And uh, so brace yourself from this. And, uh, and, and he talks about some predictions. Uh, on Sunday morning, we, we've been talking about some of these similar passages in Matthew, where Jesus is, seems to be predicting uh, the, the destruction of the temple 40 years later. Um, but what is fascinating is the rationality he gives when he talks about this coming suffering. And he says, 
For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? And he's describing himself. He says, God is here with you. The presence of God is here with you. And this is how people are responding to it. When the time comes and I am no longer here, when times are, when, when I am no longer present in this physical way, you know, and things are manifestly more difficult, how much worse will it be? This is the good that it gets is me being killed, me being crucified. And the reason why I think it's important is because um, there's lots of places throughout the Bible where, especially in the New Testament, where the, uh, the, the Gospels or the letters will be telling us about uh, persecutions that come. And Jesus keeps talking about, you know, people will know, you know, people, you will be mistreated because you're my disciples. And um, I live in a world, and probably most people who are watching this live in a world where I can live in relative comfort. Um, I have a place where I can be. My house uh, can be heated. Um, I have a vehicle. I can drive places. I am gainfully employed. I can uh, feed my family. Um, I, you know, I live in a part of the world where being a pastor of a church, being a church member, uh, carries with it some social um, you know, benefits even, let alone, and Jesus is, and so it's such a very different picture than what Jesus is portraying. And I, on the one hand, do not want to invite persecution. That is a, a terrible thing. Nobody wants to go through persecution. And yet, Jesus is saying, when I'm not physically here, things are going to get worse. And uh, there's other places where Jesus talks about, you know, basically, uh, you're being disciplined because you're my disciples. And there's other places where we read about that, that basically, Suffering is part of what it means to be a disciple. And if I am not suffering, what does that say? And I don't know for sure if, that's, uh, if that can be taken up just directly and plopped into my life. And maybe it can. But it is a thing that I, if I, I, it's so easy, I think, to simply say, oh, that was then and this is now. But what other things about the Bible would I not accept someone saying, well, that was then and this is now? And uh, it's a reminder to look at those once again and say, you know, is, uh, is suffering, is hardship, uh, is not getting my way necessarily a bad thing as far as the kingdom of God is concerned? Um, is it possible that uh, I only have things comfortable and my way because of ways in which I have been unfaithful? Uh, and I at least have to be open to that possibility, because if I shut that possibility out from the very beginning, uh, then the one thing I'm not doing is listening to God. Um, I don't know exactly what God might be saying to me or to you in the midst of all that, but I, I don't know that we can be faithful disciples and simply assume that what God really wants for all of his people is comfort <laughs> and peace and all the rest, because that is not what Jesus says uh, in this passage or in many other places. So I want to leave you with that as I continue to wrestle with that myself. Well, that's all for today. Come back in tomorrow. We'll continue on with more of the Gospel of Luke. Have a good day.